right, we live in a really exciting time and we're getting ready to send humans deeper into space than ever before. SpaceX is building a starship and they're designing systems to support missions to distant destinations like Mars. But when I look at the headlines and think about the big picture of what's being developed, I realize there's one really important thing missing. I'll give you a hint. They have it in Star Wars, Star Trek, Starship Troopers, Star everything. Gravity. I couldn't stop thinking about this day and night. I even had dreams about it. In TV shows and movies, there's always some totally ridiculous gravity system that just magically works. On the other hand, 2001 A Space Odyssey had a spin system which seems a bit more practical. So I did some research about centripetal force and I came up with a concept called the Gravity Link Starship. So I'll explain how the GLS works and then we can talk about why artificial gravity is so important for the health and comfort of the crew. At the end of the video, we can get into the math that supports this design. The GLS is basically a hub ship, like the hub of a wheel. Instead of humans and cargo, the payload bay of the GLS is filled with truss that can robotically fold out and lock into place, serving as the wheel's spokes. This type of system avoids the expensive and impractical massive space stations you see in the movies that would require a ridiculous launch system and major space construction, not to mention a crazy amount of power to actually push the thing to Mars. The best way to travel away from Earth is to accelerate your spacecraft to a speed fast enough to leave the influence of Earth's gravity, and then once you reach such a speed, you just cut off your engines and coast in what they call a transfer orbit around the sun. The process is not like a car or a plane that use energy to maintain their speed. It's more like a bullet, which uses a burst of energy at the start of its journey, and then it just floats. And when floating through the vacuum of space, your speed doesn't change, so you just coast around the solar system. For a journey to Mars, your coast phase can last a whole six months, giving us our opportunity to implement artificial gravity. Once the GLS and two passenger starships are on their way to Mars, the GLS deploys its truss, which will fold out and lock into place. The passenger starships can now make their approach to the attachment points. Once attached, one starship remains fixed, while the other one slowly rotates its orientation on its swivel joint. Now the main engines are facing opposite each other, and we can use them to spin the system, thus creating a centripetal force equal to Earth's gravity. So when the desired spin speed, and by extension, the amount of artificial gravity force is achieved, it's actually pushing towards the side of the ship. So both starships will swivel themselves into a resting position. This orientation is in line with the truss, so the gravity is pulling in the right direction, down. We can also orient the whole spin system so that the axis it spins on is perpendicular to the sun. This way, implementation of things like solar panels, shades, and radiators can make sense. So as you can see, the GLS concept provides a spin gravity that reuses the main engines, taps leftover fuel, and avoids impractical space construction and dangerous spacewalks. However, speaking of spacewalks, with this concept we now have an opportunity for large-scale microgravity experiments and recreation. This is real footage from Skylab in the 70s, which was actually an emptied out rocket hull that would have been used to hold fuel tanks for Apollo missions. Imagine suiting up in a vacuum suit that has extra padding and protection to play space football inside the empty, slowly rotating hull of the GLS, which won't have floors dividing it like the passenger starships. So of course, after six months of gravity helping the space travelers enjoy sweet, sweet sleep and bathroom use, they're going to arrive at Mars and need to stop the spin. The starships will swivel to orient themselves in reverse and another short burn slows the system so the ships can detach to prepare for Mars arrival. The GLS will fold up and land on Mars as well to refuel for the journey back to Earth. Okay, when it's time to return to Earth, everything gets deployed and attached again during the coast phase. This is the part where fine control of the spin speed gives the space travelers an added benefit. At the beginning of the return journey, they can start the spin off slower to provide a force more closely resembling Mars's lower gravity. Using additional engine burns over the course of the journey, the gravity force can be increased, giving the space travelers a much more healthy and comfortable experience adapting. This is really important because they just spent a year and a half on a planet with only 38% of Earth's gravity. So here's why I think my design is good as opposed to other people's ideas. And the number one most frequently asked question about the GLS is why don't we just do away with the truss and use some sort of non-rigid tether, like a steel cable used on a crane? Now, in my opinion, a steel cable system seems much less likely to succeed. 
With a flaccid connection, not only are you introducing a whole set of catastrophic failure possibilities, the RCS thrusters won't have control authority to stabilize the spin. Most importantly though, without the rigid truss system the GLS carries to space, you wouldn't be able to use main engines to start and stop the spin. People also ask, why not just use RCS to speed up and slow down the spin? RCS, for those of you who don't know, stands for Reaction Control Systems and is usually a compressed gas or rocket propellant that gets spouted out of a spacecraft to help it orient itself. Sometimes it's used for translation, as you can see in this clip. While RCS will certainly be crucial for stabilizing the spin, maintaining the spin, and helping the electric swivel joint motors point the starships in the right directions for spin burns. But it's just not practical to use RCS to fully accelerate and decelerate this many hundreds of tons of mass to the spin speed required and also stabilize it and also have enough propellant left over for the rest of the mission. Now that I've shown you my idea, we should touch on why having gravity is so important. There's a myriad of health issues associated with a lack of gravity, from bone loss to impaired eyesight to DNA issues to cognitive function. If you want to learn more about that, look it up, because I want to spend some time having some more fun talking about the secondary reason, comfort. Can you imagine strapping yourself to a wall for bedtime while you experience an unending sensation of freefall? Here's how you brush your teeth on the ISS, and here's the bathroom. Can you imagine trying to get a hole in one as you aim your poops? Now take a look at Scott Kelly here. His heart is pumping blood at full force around his body, but the veins in his feet and legs don't have any gravity resistance. So his system is filling his upper body with blood, pumping it upwards. The opposite happened when he got back to Earth after a year. He told his story about how his ankles and feet swole up to the size of bowling balls because all the blood got pushed back down in his body. One of the more interesting things I read about in International Space Station news was about sex. Apparently, sex is the last thing a human wants when they're flying around in microgravity. It's so uncomfortable that when ISS cosmonauts were asked to produce semen samples for scientific purposes, they refused. So at this point in the video, let's dive into the math that supports my design. I calculated that to comfortably experience 1G, the system needs to reach 3 RPMs and have a radius of around 100 meters. You can mess around with the system specs yourself, just Google spin calc or go to artificialgravity.com. But remember, the truss needs to be small enough to fold up and fit inside the volume of a starship's payload bay, and needs to have the tensile strength to hang 400 to 1,000 metric tons. I aimed for 1G on deck 2 or so, so at deck 0, where you might put your exercise machines, you would experience 5% extra gravity. And up in the nose, say on deck 7, where the bridge could be, you would experience 88% of Earth's gravity. On the way home from Mars, starting off at 2 RPMs would produce a force equal to Mars's gravity on deck 2. Now according to current specs, the Starship will be 85 metric tons empty. Add a payload of 150 tons of humans, equipment, and cargo, and you've got 235 tons. The propellant tanks get refilled while orbiting Earth to 1100 tons of propellant mass. So let's use the delta V number of 4.3 kilometers per second I took from Wikipedia to get from low Earth orbit to Mars transfer orbit. The trans-Mars injection burn should use around 915 tons of fuel and oxidizer, leaving each starship with a total mass of 420 tons, 185 tons of which is leftover propellant. We're starting to see here just how tyrannical the rocket equation is, going from 1100 tons of propellant to 185. That's okay though, because to initiate the spin once deployed and connected, each passenger starship will only use just under 3 tons of propellant to change their tangential velocity from 0 meters per second to about 25 meters per second. Add in the mass of half of the GLS at the axis, or fulcrum of the system, plus the truss mass, and let's call it 3 tons of propellant well spent. At 100% throttle, a single vacuum raptor uses almost a ton of propellant per second, so the burn could be 3 seconds long. However, we want to minimize stress on the truss, so the engines can be throttled down to 20%. As I said before, the most important requirement of the truss is that it can hang the weight of a starship as it pulls outwards on the system with 1G of force. I think it's fun to imagine two revolving apartment buildings. When the destination is reached, another three tons of propellant is required to slow the spin down to a stop. Thanks for watching. Please drop a like, a subscribe, or hell, tweet this at Elon so he can tell us what he thinks about the GLS. I believe that figuring out artificial gravity is really important for the future of space exploration, especially for distant destinations. 
Mars is our closest and most practical planetary target. A two and a half year expedition without artificial gravity will be brutal and have devastating effects on the space travelers. Special thanks to the everyday astronaut, Tim Dodd, who has been inspiring me ever since I started watching his videos. And thanks to SpaceX for teaching us to think outside of our limitations by finding clever ways to reuse our equipment. Over and out. <laughs>